any other device that, that any other inventor has and, and examine that. It just sounds a lot like cold fusion. Well, cold fusion is part of it. Cold, cold fusion is part. Of it. But cold fusion is, is slightly different than what we're talking about, but it's in the, it would be in the same category. Except it produces water vapor. And you know how bad <laughs> water fusion vapor is. A hydropower car will. Oh, excuse me. Um, really? Yeah. yeah. Well, the, the amount of <laughs> water vapor. This is interesting, though. Did you say they actually have this working? Well, they say they do. And you see, they, they have, they have numerous claims that people have come up with that they have these, these uh, devices that create more energy than they take in. But there's no real solid evidence that this is true. Theoretically, it, theoretically, it should be true, but it's just never been it's never been reduced to a practical machine. This is a, I mean, if this was true, you're essentially saying there could be a perpetual motion machine developed. Yeah. Okay. Well, see, but now it's not in the sense of a perpetual motion. Well, it is because of the amount of energy around you. Sure. It's just another energy. It's that, that sort of you're going to put people off. It's taking energy out of the vacuum and running a machine. And because there's so much energy around, maybe it'll run forever. That's okay. But it's no there's no mystery to it. Mm -hmm. You're taking energy from one source and cre and transferring it and doing something useful for it with it and another source. What about the power? So it's not really like a perpetual. It's actually just a way to harness energy and it's utilizing energy and not a perpetual motion machine. Well, since the uh, since the sump from which you're taking the energy is almost inexhaustible, yeah. then it is in effect a perpetual. But it doesn't violation. It doesn't violate any of the uh, laws of thermodynamics. You know that energy can never be created or destroyed, and that uh, entropy continues to rise, which it does. Uh, the, the, the world is once 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 you've created something of uh, a high level, it's gonna of its natural accord, it's gonna it's gonna run down to a, a level that's less complicated. That's that's the definition of energy from complicated to less complicated. That that cannot be violated, but in this dimension. But but zero point energy doesn't violate either one of those laws. Mm -hmm. Now Plato, I've got articles on here explaining how that might. He has actually done a lot of theoretic work along this line. The thing that's missing here is not the theory. The thing that's missing is the actual trans. The production of a device which demonstrates. But the just theory. like the Wright brothers, I mean, they flew for years before anyone would acknowledge that they actually flew. Well, that's true. That's true. No I mean, one. They had to go to the French because the Americans wouldn't even talk to them. That is true, Molly. But we're, what's, we're what's the home of the Wright brothers? Missing, no, North Carolina is not the home of the Wright brothers. What's missing in this right discussion on well, this development is support. The, Hal put off has a budget of maybe three million dollars a year. It's got about five or six brilliant guys working for him. This is a little tiny company. Yeah. All of these guys are. What do you think their budget is? I don't know. It's small. It's certainly not. It's nothing any better. Here are some other. See this 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 is a Russian here. That's a Russian. This is, this is, see, the, in, the conception for active properties of the, there is some natural physical mechanism for reduction of heat energy that is demonstrated by any star, and it is not the thermonuclear reaction but the transformation energy by the mechanism of cause enough. That's, that is de de definite in that concept, the kind of energy used by the star for 
is the time flow, which is the direct production of energy from space time. Space time is energy. No, the stars are harnessing it. On the, ha uh, on the other hand, we take into consider the, gra the gravitational description of space instead of its chronal description, and the production of heat is the transformation of these that we've noted above. Uh, Hey, Dad, I'm going to offer you a Kleenex because you're about to drip all over uh, the papers. These, this is basically what we're talking about, mm -hmm. is the direct transformation of energy that's all around us to something that we could use practically. That's, that's the thing that came out of the Hobbit magazine. Mm -hmm. That's probably what you're... Is that nanotechnology? That's the nanotechnology. And they're yeah. calling it voodoo physics. Yeah. yeah. I remember that from voodoo economics, yeah. why side economics. What's that? So why side economics will work real well. Um, they're, they, they're, whenever they attack a new field of science, they call it voodoo something. Like here they're calling it voodoo physics. Well, I remember the voodoo economics being supply side economics, and that's pretty much what's dominated the U.S. policy since 1982. I think we can all pretty much agree the, the economics have been pretty, pretty solid since 1982. And yet, when it was originally introduced, they called it voodoo economics. Well, it's easy to demonize someone They, de else. they use that term to demonize. Uh, if you, you know, if you break the status quo, or you, you, you uh, challenge the conventional wisdom, that's, what, that's typically the way they handle it, aren't which you, is unfortunate. Aren't you doing that with the global warming? Yep, and I'm probably called a voodoo global warmingist. So, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, but I, I get, uh, uh, you can imagine the hate mail I get the presentations that I give. So, are there uh, other people like you? Uh, there are a lot of global warming skeptics. Yeah, there's uh, quite a few of them. There's one, a very prominent one at, at MIT. Uh, Dr. Lindzen is at, at MIT. Uh, if you really want to see um, a good presentation, uh, the BBC now has a show called the uh, the Great Global Warming Swindle. Uh, it was it was it was recently shown on BBC. You can see it on the internet. Uh, it's called the the Global Great Global Warming Swindle, and it goes through. Um, the history of the global warming science. What's kind of interesting about it is, um, I've been giving this presentation for over a year, and when you watch it, you're gonna say, wait a minute, it's, they're almost identical. So when the BBC looked at the, the science, they reached this almost identical conclusion that we've done with the uh, Internet Skeptic presentation. But I really recommend watching it, and it also gets into the political motivations, as you mentioned with Margaret Thatcher. It shows the, the seeding of global warming and why all the efforts are, toward, are directed towards CO2 and not studying the sun and water vapor. Can you explain that again? Well, uh, originally, uh, this whole global warming theory comes out um, from Mar uh, Margaret Thatcher's administration when they were trying to push for um, nuclear power. They had to somehow oh. get a political motivation behind it. Uh, and so that's, that's why all this focus has been at, at demonizing CO2 is because they wanted to use that to justify um, nuclear power. The only problem is it took on its whole new, a whole new life of itself and has now become this giant uh, theory um, that's, that's totally misdirected from what it was originally intended to do. But it shows you why there's so much effort towards CO2 is because that's where the funding went. You were paid to go prove CO2 caused it, which is not good science to begin with. Typically you study something to explain it. They went out to prove CO2 causes global warming, not to study what is causing global warming. It's, it's a different approach. It's bad science. But Margaret Thatcher was a long time ago. Yeah, it was back. That's where that's where Margaret Thatcher's uh, I, um, efforts to um, uh, promote nuclear power is where they started to come up with. We had to somehow stamp out CO2 and the internal combustion engine and things like that. It's covered in the global warming, um, the great global warming swindle. Uh, much better than I'm, I can do here. And but that's I, a documentary? It's a documentary done by the BBC, uh, and I really it. encourage you to watch it. Also, you'll, you'll see a lot of what we do in the other presentations also, because they have the science and they, they review the science. They reach the same conclusion that we do here, that um, it's water vapor, it's not CO2, and that CO2 is, is basically the political mechanism by which they're getting this done. John? This is ex this is a wonderful, very important point. I'm, I'm certainly going to go back and explore that as best I can. One thing is point, that's worth pointing out in the creation of energy from the zero point point of view, and that is 
whatever would be created would be on the light end of the uh, carbon, or, or the, excuse me, the atomic scale. So that if you did have a, uh, a, a fusion or a, a fission reaction, the, the byproducts would be benign. In other words, it'd be very short-lived as opposed to the fission of uranium, which is one of the heaviest of all the atoms. And when the uranium atom splits, you get some very undesirable uh, byproducts like uh, strontium-90 and iodine-60, which are intensely radioactive for ten thousands of years. Is that called when you split uranium, yeah, the, depleted uranium is what she's asking. Is that the, what the, the, the so-called nuclear power plants now all either use, uh, high, you know, enriched uranium, or but they the, use plutonium. But the byproduct is that called depleted uranium? The byproduct is is, is a no is a, is a split of the uranium atom. In other words, the uranium splits into into strontium and to iodine and to various a whole whole collection of, of fragments but the worst ones uh, uh, radioactive you, the of a very high intensity for a very long period of time whereas if you the fusion reaction you, the byproduct of that is 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 is, uh, is either helium or hydrogen and uh, those we can live with that. Yeah. Th 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 those don't last very long. First, the intensity is quite low, and the and the life of the of the particle is very short. So it, that's the way you want to go. But I guess what Paul is asking about is because we hear a lot of talk about them. There's depleted uranium, for example, in Iraq. Yeah. Now, what exactly is depleted uranium? Is well, that the byproduct of uh, splitting? Well, together? it's a byproduct of a power plant. When because if you if you if you if you see a power plant is is a condition of your is a concentration of uranium that's uh, high enough to keep a a nuclear reaction operational. In other words, to keep it going. And when it when when you get up to a certain neutron flux in the pile, which is just a big block of material, uh, then you put tubes through it and take the heat off and create steam, and that's what, and that of course creates electric power. That's the cycle. It's quite a simple cycle, but then. And those are the rods that everybody talks about. No, the rods simply control. They they are put through the carbon blocks to control the density of the. Uh, neutron flux inside uh, it's it's the rods are a control mechanism they're made out of different things cadmium is one but it anyhow uh, a bomb you need about 80 percent concentration of uranium 235 or, or plutonium and then then at a critical weight of about 20 or 30 pounds they they, it's an uncontrolled release and in the form of a bomb, but in, for a power plant you only need about 20% uranium. And the whole problem with Iran is that rather than sticking with the 20%, they want to further enrich it to bomb grade material, which has no real utility as a power plant, but uh, it's very dangerous as a bomb. So that's what we're all, that's what people are up in arms about. But as far as the depleted uranium goes, naturally if you, if you start off with 20% and you burn it for a long time, it's going to get depleted to a point where it's no longer very useful. That, that is one of the, but, but the, the worst part of it is when the uranium actually splits the U-235. The U-238 doesn't really enter into the reaction, but the U-235 when it splits, well, it does. It, no, it, I'm sorry. It is part of the reaction, but most of that is left. And uh, the really dangerous part of it is the byproducts, the, the, the fission products of the reaction. Now, there are ways of reprocessing spent fuel so that you can 
build it up again uh, to the level of the original 20%, but when by reprocessing it, reprocessing it, it's it's quite dangerous. That's called breeding, the breeder reactor. We we worked on that. This country did for under the Carter administration, and it was abandoned because the steps that you take to reprocess the uranium are equally dangerous. So and, and amenable to. So either way, it's a bad way to go. Is what you're saying. Either either way, is 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 to me unacceptable. I I would be very much opposed to us expanding the number of power plants that the nuclear power plants that are around today. I mean, I think that if depending on how the CO2 things goes, I mean, there are different ways of doing it, but. Uh, Nuclear power doesn't make any sense to me at all. Can we flip it on the other side? Recently, I heard that China supposedly has a fusion reactor. Reactor. You read anything about that, and do you think that's possible? I doubt it. No, uh, uh, very active fusion. It's the, they, they call it. Um, you know, they're, they're harnessing the heat of the sun. They're they're taking two heliums and turning them into hydrogen. Hydrogen, they take a few hydrogen to turn into helium. Helium. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> Get a little backwards. Well, they take they take a heavy hydrogen. Yeah. It's called heavy, heavy. It's heavy water. Heavy water. It's hydrogen with an extra. Uh, Enriched water, isn't it? No, no. It's got an extra uh, neutron in in the middle of it. So uh, instead of having an atomic number of one, it's atomic number of two. But, so that would be H three O. Well, if, no, if you combine it with oxygen, it's H2O, but if... It's a heavier water. It's, yeah, it's, it's a, a heavier water. It's a, it has a higher, heavier, <laughs> a higher atomic number. See, H2O would be 1 plus 16 or 17, and heavy water would be 18. But you don't think China could do it? Well, you know, we've worked on... It, it, at Princeton, uh, we have a reactor there a program, a fusion program, and they, they've been making progress, but they still haven't been able. What they do there is they encapsulate the inside. You have to get to a temperature of millions of degrees uh, to, to, to create the fusion. So they encapsulate this, or they, they don't encapsulate it, they, they restrain it in a and a, a, uh, and a magnet, which is in the core of a hollow magnet, and a spherical magnet. And to date, there's no real evidence. They can create fusion, but the problem is they, it takes more energy to create the fusion than they get out of it. It's not a, it's not a generator, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, a it actually takes energy to make the reaction so go. So it's a net negative energy. It's a net reduction. negative. We see we're oh. talking here about 100 percent, yeah. over 100 percent. Yeah. So, oh. yeah. How do they create a hydrogen bomb then? Well, is that that's just because it's uncontrolled. Yeah. It releases more energy. Well, the the trigger is a, a, a uranium bomb. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, which gets up to the temperature where it fuses. I didn't know that. So you have two bombs going on there. Yeah, they, to create the temperature that's necessary to, to have the fusion of the hydrogen, you have to you have to sh shoot off a uranium bomb. Well, it's only 30 pounds. Oh, I always wondered how that works. Yeah. Huh. So, so that fusion we can fusion can be accomplished, but. At a price. Yeah, at a huge price. It's not a practical at, at the moment. It's not a practical form of energy. Now, coal fusion is another process altogether, where you create enough. That is described in this little pamphlet I have here. Mm -hmm. And it's, of course, it, Palms. What was the guy's name? Palms and Fleiss. Yeah. They about 20 years ago. And and uh, which what what was this? It's been taken up again by, I have a brochure on that, or 
I think it's Purdue. And well, what do you think? Is there at any it possibility that, that cold fusion might be? Able to well, theoretically, yes. You, if you get enough, if you can build up enough uh, electrons on one of the cathodes, uh, you should be able to do it. But, but once again, is it? Uh, do you get a hundred percent more, or I mean, hundred percent plus, or is it still sort of? It's, a it's close, Molly. All of these devices. Uh, so all we need is like thirty billion or a hundred billion dollars. If, if you had the, the 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 top scientists in this country with an unlimited budget, the way they had at Oak Ridge, somebody would break it. Well, there's a good there's a good uh, lead-in because what are they talking about spending to save global warming? There's three to five percent of our GDP. There's your hundred billion right there on an annual basis. Yeah. So instead of fighting CO two, if we directed it towards there. That to me, and that's why I'm so adamant about this is, and this goes right to the thing, if you don't properly diagnose it, you're gonna waste a lot of money. Instead of wasting our money pulling fertilizer out of the air, fund some viable research like this. I mean, that's the whole point of what I'm trying to get, get to is, we're gonna be wasting a lot of money, instead we can do a lot of good with it. Well, and we're in, let's face it, if, they really, if we really faced up to it, we, we're putting how much into Iraq each year, eighty billion dollars. Some more type of a thing, yeah. And if they had no oil, would we be over there? That's some expensive there's oil. A, that's all I got to say. That's why aren't we? In, if if it's humanitarian, why aren't we in Darfur? Yeah. Or, or, yeah. or why isn't the UN? Um. Uh, well, this is the this is the Internet Skeptic, and uh, this has been a, an absolutely wonderful event. I, I really appreciate you having me down here and meeting you. It's been absolutely wonderful to meet everybody, uh, and it's just a pleasure to talk to people with open minds. Uh, I've run into a lot of people with closed minds that get very angry and hostile, and I think I've learned a lot here, uh, just because it just one gives me more motivation to keep on with the uh, the fight because. Clearly, if we don't, I mean, because right now they're talking about spending an astronomical amount of money on something that I think is going to be a total waste. Whereas we have some viable options here that can show you that we can solve the energy crisis, we can our energy crisis, we can direct that, re, that those revenues towards something else that will actually do society some good instead of just simply, you know, spinning our wheels. I mean, I, I think that the byproduct of all the money spent on global warming will actually probably have. A good effect. Mm -hmm. However, I, I mean, I totally agree with you that I think that m maybe when you give your lectures, you've really got to emphasize that point that that this is money yeah. that should be directed. I didn't realize that three percent of our GDP, you know, or uh, was One, going towards. Well, that. no, I'm sorry. Let me clarify. They're talking about a tax of around three percent of the GDP to pay for it. Um, I've seen estimates range from twelve to three hundred million dollars a year um, to. Uh, 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 abide by the Kyoto Treaty. So uh, to, to to go and to follow it fully, you're talking three to five percent of GDP, and that's a lot of money that could be spent elsewhere. Yeah. Yeah. What, one thing I would be cautious about is that people somehow confuse global warming with the uh, the terrible effects of, of air pollution and water pollution that industry puts out. You know. Uh, they sort of it seems somehow to be part of the same package, which it's really not at all. Uh, if if uh, I would hate to, you know, unfortunately, the Bush administration has been uh, they, they just seem to be unconscious as to what industry does to the environment. The environment. No, uh, I, I don't think they're unconscious. I just think that if they actually acknowledge what they're doing, then they have to do something about it. They have to take responsibility. Well, see, global warming has somehow become part of, uh, it, it is thought of as a, as a pollutant. And, and if it's not a pollutant, there are pollutants out there that are very dangerous. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I know, because we used to, sure. I was with the DuPont company, and we did, did our fair that, share of dumping that, all this stuff out in there. Yeah. Tell, tell them about how you used to set the, the river on fire so that it wouldn't spontaneously combust. <laughs> <laughs> well, chemical plants have done their fair share of damage, and uh, it's deplorable what, what they have done. But, but, so, and unfortunately, global warming has been wrapped into that package. Exactly. 
And, exactly. And you, somehow you have to separate it out and say, look, this this is different than the pollution that comes out of the tailpipe of a car that really does hurt you. Or, or for instance, we didn't we didn't talk about the destruction of the ozone layer, and that. They're fighting the wrong enemy. Yeah. They should be fighting pollution, not CO2. No, but that, pollution is not they, something they want to take responsibility for. Yeah, and, and, but, but my point is it's a distraction.